Tudo bem? Boa tarde. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us in this very special session on the Brazilian New Roadmap. It's my great pleasure to welcome Minister Fernando Haddad and Minister Marina Silva, especialmente, particularly because they've only been not even two weeks into their jobs. So we really, really appreciate that you're joining us here in Davos, and we wish you much success in your efforts in Brazil. As you know, President Lula's third mandate has been confronted with a completely different context, both internationally and locally, from compounded crisis globally to domestic challenges and also a polarized country. Facing the new Brazilian government are significant challenges, but also I would like to highlight the plenty and great opportunities that can also be found in Brazil. And the whole world was shocked with the events of January 8th. The, these received domestic and international disapproval. But in the aftermath, we believe that this is also an opportunity for Brazil to bring political leaders together in a consensus for a democratic governance and to build a long-term vision that can provide stability, sustainability, and prosperity for Brazil. We would love to have your perspectives on that, Minister Haddad, por favor. In particular, sobre os eventos de... Especially regarding the events. Posterior aos eventos. Olha, eu penso que... Well, we can't deny that the extreme right, the far right, has really organized itself in Brazil. Not only did it organize itself well, it was elected in 2018, it governed during four years, and it was free to approve whatever it wished inside our Congress. And undeniably, it will be the opposition that Lula's government will face. That's what it's about, and I, that is very serious, because despite the fact that Brazil has seen the far-right movements in the past, especially between the wars and after the Second World War, it never was able to elect itself. And now it has managed to get elected. However, I think President Lula has established a very wide coalition, a very strong coalition at the first round. And at the second round of elections, he broadened this front, and now he has a solid base that is a bit fragile due to the way in which uh, parties are organized in Brazil, but I think it is robust enough for us to be able to face the challenges that will come and that we will have to face, especially coming from the far right. I think the response to what happened on January 8th was very important, institutionally speaking. So 27 governors, all of them, were there. We had representatives from all three powers all came together to make the necessary decisions, what was really required for us to be able to overcome the mess that Brasilia became on the 8th. So the governor of the federal district was removed from office. We created a special secretariat. And in less than 24 hours, the the it had been settled we had lots of people who were arrested people who uh, damaged all these buildings and these people now will have to respond for their actions and we are now looking at who financed the act because they weren't in brasilia but we have been able able to identify some of them and they will need to respond for what they did I am concerned because, of course, you're not in a comfortable position when you have an opposition that is extreme. 
we need parties that are committed to democracy being elected, and that's not what it's about now in Brazil. But I believe that with President Lula and because of all the different personalities that have uh, that want to collaborate with the government, I do think we will be successful. Could you please also, Marina, share your perspectives of what happened? Thank you, Marisol. First of all, I'd like to thank the opportunity. It's very symbolic to have the Minister of the Environment and the Minister of Finance sitting here to debate the perspectives uh, for Brazil. And as was mentioned by Minister Haddad, how we're going to overcome the huge difficulties we're facing. I agree completely with Minister Haddad when he says that for no country, for no government, is it comfortable to be in a position where the opposition is made up of extremists. But on the other hand, the Brazilian government understands that this is a phenomenon that doesn't happen only in Brazil. It's happening all over the world. Of course, democracies are working very hard to be able to face the situation. These situations create a lot of instability, not only politically speaking, but also in terms of economics, social aspects, public policies, and also to be able to invest and improve people's quality of life. On the other hand, we don't want to be comfort Com uh, to find comfort that what happened in Brazil also happened in the capital and it maybe happened elsewhere. We don't find this reassuring. That's why what Minister Adad has said is important for us to consider that we were able, yes, to respond in very few hours, showing that our institutions are strengthened. And despite the fact that we have a divided society, 60 million voted for Lula and 48 million voted for Bolsonaro, a good portion of the people who voted for Bolsonaro do not agree with these extreme acts. So. I believe we are facing an international phenomenon. We're going to act very strongly internally so we can strengthen our democracy, but not only Brazilian democracy. We have to look at what is happening in Latin America. It will be a joint effort through partnerships. President Lula is set to travel throughout the region so that we can have this action. It will be an action of solidarity and it will always have to be a response that looks at economic aspects, social aspects and political aspects. We need to be able to face the very serious problems we have, social problems, environmental problems, problems so that we have uh, good perspectives for Brazil. That stability that Brazil is seeking to learn the lessons from other countries, not to repeat them, but rather to find consensus solutions to strengthen Brazil's uh, democratic governance, which is fundamental to attract investments, to boost the economy. And it is great to have you, Minister Adaj. It's very important your presence in the Foro Economico Mundial. It's great to have you here, Minister Adad. That you presented recently to uh, reduce Brazil's deficit and to boost the economy. Can you share with us uh, just the highlights of those of that plan? Well, to be honest, it's not really an ambitious plan, and I'm going to explain why. We are inheriting a problem that wasn't caused by the pandemic, but rather uh, 
by the loss, by the fact that the government lost these last elections. So when the government saw, the previous government saw that it was in a, an unfavorable dis situation, it took lots of measures to spend. Some maybe were justified if in social t terms, but they were done in a very political way. And also, they had tax exemptions up to 1.1% of the Brazilian GDP that they did not earn. And so that created a huge unbalance in our, our accounts, and we need to settle that. So what are we doing in basic terms? Brazil had a primary surplus, and that was reduced, that surplus was reduced over the last decade, especially with the political crisis of 2013 that led to the impeachment in 2016. So looking at history, we want to be able to have revenues and expenses that are the same as the level before the pandemics, which is 18.7% at the federal level. So if we're able to do that in two years' time, we will be able to have zero deficit. And this will be much easier if we're able to approve the tax reform that is currently in Congress and is supported by President Lula. This reform was not approved by the previous, not supported by the previous government, but it does have our support. So we want to balance our accounts, and this will come accompanied by a series of measures, regulatory measures for credit, for reindustrialization, looking at the ecologic transition that is necessary in Marina is a representative of that. With regional integration, President Lula wants to stimulate this regional um, coordination starting right now. He's going to Argentina soon. So if we're able to do that and rebalance our accounts, you can be sure that Brazil will start growing again above global averages, as happened during the first governments of Lula, growing above average when the world had 2.8%, Brazil had 4.5% during the two mandates of President Lula, and that's what we want to go back to being able to grow above global average with, of course, more social justice and looking at how to preserve the environment. Ambitious. <laughs> and uh, I think it's, it's very important. Uh, Brazil has the 12th largest economy in the world. Despite the international context, you have so many resources. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's really important to have that focalized approach and have all the the support, uh, not only from other leaders in the uh, government or in other political parties, but also from business. And what has been that reaction that you have perceived from investors and from business leaders to your plans? I think the reaction has been very good. Today I was reading some articles in the Brazilian media about this topic, and I also read some articles in the international media. There's a Financial Times article about the measures that we have taken. I think these measures are focused on an objective that everyone can understand and that is easy to um to, to accomplish, but of course, as you said, we want to go beyond. In, in terms of the economy now, we have some specific problems, a big um, retail store that's going through some problems in Brazil, but I think the market has understood what the Lula's government means, stability, predictability, a development plan for the mid and long term that is socially responsible. So I think the authority of the president and his reputation that he has built through his first two governments will allow the country to prosper. We have seen how the world has embraced a President Lula 
We observed uh, many dignitaries that accompanied the inauguration, but we were also very impressed to see how welcome his environmental plans were during the meeting in Sharm el Sheikh during COP27, where you were also Minister Marina a participant. Um, can you also share with our audience what are your priorities? There have been some very important announcements already made, uh, beginning with your title. You're no longer the Minister of Environment, you're the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. But there's been other announcements that are very relevant that we would be very grateful if you could share with us, but also some of your priorities moving forward. Yes, President Lula went to COP27 and was received very warmly People would go up to him and they had been saying for a while that Brazil was missed in all these multilateral events. And we also miss the leadership that Brazil has always had in terms of the environmental agenda, the fight against desertification, the protection of biodiversity all the contributions we were able to make to the negotiation processes and everything we were able to gain in terms of the climate agenda. Brazil is the first con developing country that has established CO2 um, targets and we have here a member of the IPCC. He has helped us a lot. Professor Carlos Nobri is here. and. Unfortunately, of course, that leadership was disappeared during the past four years, putting Brazil in a very difficult situation when we look at the environmental agenda, the human rights agenda, but also how to fight social inequality. Brazil was no longer in the FAO world hunger map, but now it is back. We had reached a virtuous cycle to be able to reduce deforestation, and today we have record levels of deforestation, and the environmental agenda has been completely dismantled. So the announcements made by President Lula are basically, we are back, we are back to the international agenda to talk about climate, to talk about targets that are ambitious for the climate but also for biodiversity. We agree that we need to preserve 30% of these priority areas to have a good conservation of biodiversity all over the world. This was something that came from the biodiversity COP, but Brazil wants to also make a contribution on the topic of climate change. Not only what we will be able to do internally, but also helping so that we can go even beyond regulation. There is good global regulation, but there, the investments are, lack, are lacking. And the 100 billion that the wealthy country had committed were, are, no, are still not here. We need to have resources for mitigation actions, but also adaptation. And now, based on the last conversion on biodiversity and on climate, we have a new agenda with new commitments for vulnerable countries. Brazil also wants to be a leader for a global initiative that defends forests, and we are talking with all the countries that have large forests so that we can reduce the amount of forest that is being lost at the global level. And we have a commitment internally to reach zero deforestation by 2030. We have a commitment so that Brazil will be able to go from an economy that is carbon intensive to a low carbon economy, so talking about um, ecology, the ecological transition, bioeconomy, all of these investments, I'm very proud to talk about them here, but all of that has been agreed with by our Minister of Finance, and I think the synergy we have established, it's a characteristic of Lula's government for the third time now, as he has been chosen by 
the Brazilian people to govern them for the third time, and we will have a government that will work strongly to make dem democracy more stable, to face social inequalities, because we have 33 million people who are hungry, and to work to establish a new cycle of prosperity with infrastructures for sustainable development. We have a huge potential because we have a very clean energy matrix to be able to produce green hydrogen. All of that will be essential for economies and for countries who are facing energy insecurity, especially in the context of the 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 war, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. So these are opportunities that we consider to be very promising, but of course not losing sight of the difficulties to be able to have a stable democracy. I think it's better to announce less and do more than to announce a lot of things and then be frustrated. But talking about our targets in terms of deforestation, we have the Amazon fund that is back, we have a plan to combat, to fight against deforestation, and we have reestablished all the teams to be able to fight that. Minister Haddad himself has help, helped us to add another 500 million to the environmental ministries and that the donation funds are not subject to the expenditure caps. And this is very important, promising. Brazil wants to be a country that is economically prosperous, so socially just, de democratically uh, and uh, environmentally sustainable. Thank you. It provides hope to all of us that um, believe in inclusive and sustainable growth. My next question was going to be how the two ministers were going to articulate your plans, but you've already uh, <laughs> answered that question, and I think your dynamics makes it also very obvious. So let me just very quickly ask you, um, President Lula announced Belén do Pará as the city that will, as a candidate city, to host COP30. What are your ambitions towards COP30? I think that when President Lula presented Brazil as a candidate to host COP30 in Amazonia and in Belém city, it was a show that we have statements which are grand, but that we want them to materially to materialize, to translate into practice. When we say we want to fight the serious problem of deforestation concerning not only indigenous peoples that are living through a very serious situation of illegal mining in uh, indigenous land, to hold the climate meeting in Brazil is to give out a signal that we do want to attain these objectives and we want it to take place in no longer the realm of statements, but rather of results. Brazil has always led by example in fighting f poverty, in fighting deforestation, in reducing CO2 emissions. It has attempted to thread an innovative economic development pathway. Now, in a partnership with other Amazonian nations, we are making investments in order to get bioeconomics going and to hold a COP climate meeting in Amazonia is a show of our commitment of our country and continent with this important issue for the world and also to say that the responsibility of preserving it, it's not ours alone. We need partnership, technological um, support, and we also need the world to do its part because we can cut down deforestation in Amazon to zero, but we, if the rest of the world still 
uh, emits CO2, Amazonia is going to be destroyed likewise. So we have common, although differentiated, uh, responsibilities regarding these uh, great natural wealth that we have. Also about livelihoods, about making sure that those people that live in the Amazon, in the forest, but also in the urban areas, are assured with dignified livelihoods. I think that is also a very important part of the whole program, as it is what you mentioned with regard to technology, so that productivity can continue in a, in a more intense way, but not in an expanded way. So we really wish you also a, a lot of success on your road to achieving those very important objectives, not only for Brazil, but also for the rest of the world. And Brazil will also chair the G20 in 2024. And that will be part of your international portfolio, Minister Adaj. What are your plans? What are your ambitions and vision for the Brazil presidency of the G20 in 2024? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that in the first two administrations by President Lula, Marina had an enthusiastic support of the then education minister, and now she has the support of the finance minister. This means that the threshold has changed completely. Well, in February, is it February? No, February is when President Lula will travel to the United States. I think that the G20 meeting will take place in April, if I'm not mistaken. And we are starting to prepare the international agenda of President Lula, not only in this forum, but in others, because Brazil will also chair other important fora. We will take up the BRICS, Mercosur. So we are aligning all of the stars, bright stars, giving Brazil a lot of responsibility. Fortunately, with a born diplomat who is President Lula. He is someone who is highly diplomatic, who manages to speak very much at ease with everybody. He can speak on a same day to people who think very differently, and he can make people in antagonic or opposite positions reach agreements. So I think it is the right time for us to make the best of President Lula's leadership to put this in the international agenda, to put some points that are very dear to him in the international agenda. He is someone who has been in political public life for 50 years, and he's had many opportunities to defend um, very, very well uh, established um, points. I was with him in Egypt, and I was uh, and almost half of the meetings that he had during the transition period. So some of his obsessions are the issue of peace, to start talking a lot about peace. He believes that the commitment of heads of state with peace should be clearer, more resolute, and more definitive and consequent. If the world wants peace, it has to work for it and not just wish for it. The second point, the issue of lack of equality. Hunger and misery is back in many places in the world. And all of the experience accrued around the world, and especially in Brazil, of putting an end to hunger very quickly. It suffices to remember that with half a percent of the GDP, we have implemented one of the uh, largest stipend transfer programs in the world regarding hunger. And in terms of the environmental issues, President Lula has made a paradigm change. He has an understanding of the urgency, and this has given it a lot of momentum. And the issue that Marina is now back at the Ministry of the Environment and strengthened 
uh, uh, strengthen minister, uh, ministry from the point of view of its ambitions. I think that all these three are topics that are very dear to President Lula. And also the issue of democracy. Unfortunately, the world is not living through an easy political and comfortable political time. There is the dissemination of fake news, fake information that is publicized, lack of commitment even from large corporations towards political freedoms and political uh, civil freedoms. I think that these four issues are at the highest level of President Lula's priorities, and I think that this is what he's going to express at G20 with all of the economic implications that this unfolds into. You cannot have a social and environmental agenda without including the new economy. You cannot have a, an agenda of peace and democracy without talking about international relations. So I think it is a whole package. It's a vision, really, of the world that I believe that he is very well positioned to defend because of his past history at the negotiating table in large international fora. Text has changed their urgent matters that are now even more pressing than years before. And you mentioned the work with multinational companies and with the private sector. It's very important to bring all actors together into, into a vision for the long term of Brazil. And we have many representatives here from businesses and also from civil society. How are you planning to engage business leaders and civil society leaders into this vision for Brazil? Well, unfortunately, only a part of the corporations in the world of today make absolute commitments with this paradigm that I just summarized a moment ago. We have to persuade large corporations to the extent that the system allows us to, because we know that there are constraints, to take up public commitments with practical consequences, not only in these areas that I mentioned, but also in several others where corporations show commitments towards the environment with gender equality, with fighting racism, with sustainability, commitments with the new energy matrix, um, commitments with not purchasing products from countries that do not respect human rights and the environment. Namely, it is possible to engage CEOs and leaders, not only heads of state and government, but the large corporations around a civilization agenda where the First Nations are respected, uh, uh, gender diversity and other rights are respected. I think that even as consumers, we can exert our power and pressure. In Brazil, in engaging some companies, I mean, some companies were engaged with the defeated administration, and lots of people stopped buying from these companies. I am a consumer who always look attentively who is uh, um, manufacturing it. I do not buy a match from a company even that is not committed with these issues, especially with the issue of mine and yours and her freedom. How can we work with companies that do not express what they think? Well, the stakeholder metrics. Mm. And it's a very simplified way for corporations to measure their, uh, their uh, work and their commitments with environmental matters, with social matters, and matters of governance. As famoises is a gif. Um, and I think this could be a, a very important way also to make sure that we can uh, offer you some support working together, bringing the private sector and civil society. We would be delighted uh, to work with you, Minister, in your, in your endeavors and in your road to chairing G20. 
I would, I would like to ask for a very final question. And that is, if you could please share with us any insights, any previews of, of what your next plans for the Brazilian economy will be. Well, our agenda uh, has been publicized. We have taken some measures even before this administration was inaugurated. We had to approve a constitutional amendment in order to provide support to the ministries that were created once again and that I had no budget in order to fight uh, deforestation, inequality, and so on. We're now providing funds or um, stopping funds to uh, uh, sectors that were given funds irresponsibly uh, la until last year. We want we have a credit system. We want to bring families out of Sarasa, as we call it. That, that is an agency that blocks credit to indebtors. If you if you owe money and you cannot pay it back, you'll be an outcast from the credit system. So we want to bring these people back to the consumption market. We want to increase the minimum wage a little bit above inflation so that lower income families can start consuming again. We have a regulatory agenda that is going to improve the investment environment in Brazil, especially with public-private partnerships and also concessions, but also with public or government budgets in some construction works that are not privately lucrative, but that are very important in terms of externalities. Uh, the tax reform that we want to approve in Congress in the first half of the year, and that is on consumption taxes. But on the second half of the year, we want to approve one on income in order to decrease taxes from lower classes and make higher classes start paying classes. We want to balance out, uh, uh, rebalance the um, um, tax um, atmosphere in Brazil. Uh, there is Marina's ministry. We have our vice president who has taken up the development ministry, and he has a reindustrialization agenda that is geared to environmental sustainability. We also want regional integration. We're going to make bets on that. We have progressive um, presidents in almost all Latin American countries, Chile, Brazil, Argentina. We have a group of presidents who are more willing to integrate their economies than in the past. We no longer have the commodities boom from the beginning of the century, so we will have to do it differently now. Since this is the boom is not there, we have to perform an integration boom in order to favor trade and financial transactions, the credit system. We have to integrate this all in our region to call the attention of the world and attract investments. So we have a very long agenda that is very well worked out in terms of a uh, government plan. So illustrating for all of us to have directly from you and from Minister Marina Silva your plans, your priorities, your ambitions. And if, since now I would like to extend an invitation to both of you, to other ministers from Brazil and for President Lula to join us next year here in January. And I'm sure you will be able to share not only your vision but also your already accomplishments a year from now. So thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.